Uh, Pastor Tim is going to be coming up. He's going to be bringing us our next battle. Can we say it out? Not the children's story version of David and Goliath. <laughs> no. Um, but I, yeah. Praise God. He's going to speak through Tim right now. This is a man of faith right there. Woo! God might even speak through me this morning. But how's everybody doing this morning? Oh wow, that sounds great. That would be with such a lively group of folks that are doing that well. That's really amazing. Well, I'm doing pretty good. I'm glad to be here. Um, you guys, let's just, we can be real, right, in church. It's like sometimes you feel it on a Sunday morning. Like, I mean, before you get here, like, like today's a good day to wake up and get ready and get here and yeah, and then sometimes you don't really feel it. Isn't that true? And, and uh, maybe you're not feeling so well, or you're just not feeling it. But I have found in my life, I've learned to just like make a decision, like a rule in my life. Like, I, I'm not going to go by my feelings. I'm going to go by my experience of God. And every time I push through that, I don't feel like the type of feeling. I get to church, I get to small group, I just, you know, do something that I was needing to do related to, to God's kingdom and His children. He always meets us there. He always blesses us there. And I always walk out like my knuckles were dragging on the ground when I came in. I just wasn't feeling well. And you guys know the routine, but when I leave, it's always an entirely different thing. Because God will meet you when you get together with other believers. Amen? Amen. So y'all go home now. That was my message. <laughs> no, but really, um, we're in our um, Old Testament battles, Battles BC, and we've been looking at different battles in the Old Testament and just trying to understand what can we learn from the, the men and women of God that have gone before us and have fought battles, and what was the keys to their victory that we can apply in our life now. And so uh, we're in week four, but week one was Moses versus Amalek. I'm just do a super quick, for anyone that hasn't been with us, super quick review. M Moses versus Amalek, the key to victory was he didn't pray alone. And so we learned in the battles of life, never pray alone. Ask for some help. Reach out to some people. When someone reaches out to you, pray for them. Right? That was a good week. Week two, uh, Joshua versus Jericho. The key to victory was obedience and prophetic praise. And we learned that obedience positions the people of God. They were in the right place at the right time because they exactly obeyed what God told them. And then prophetic praise unleashes the armies of God. When they lifted up the shout to the Lord... They were praising him for a victory that they did not see in the natural. The walls of Jericho come crashing down and they run up and they get the victory. So that was week two, Joshua versus Jericho. Week three, Gideon versus Midian. And that's kind of a cool week because it was like a little rhyme, Gideon v. Midian. But uh, nobody cared about that as much as me, but I thought it was good. <laughs> so the key to victory in Gideon v. Midian was Gideon was authentic. Gideon was Real with God. And so when he came before the Lord, God saw a man with very little faith, but his heart was true. And so he had a real relationship with God. He didn't pull any punches. He wore his heart on his sleeve with God. God said, I can work with that. I can grow your faith. I can lead you into victory. So the key to victory was having a real relationship with God. Week four, does anybody remember week four what we said the key to victory was? Don's got it. He's sure. Today is week four. We haven't said that yet. I was just tricking you. I was just testing you to see if you paid attention at all. Today we're going to look at David versus Goliath. And we're all pretty familiar with David versus Goliath. Even if you've never been in a church, if you watch sports at least, or maybe you know politics, elections, anything where you have one side against the other, you're going to hear from time to time, this is a David versus Goliath type scenario. And what does that mean? It means you got a really little guy, right, going up against a really big guy, or like a like a like a, a you know lesser opponent against a much stronger opponent. And if they hope to win at all, it's going to take a miracle, because.
Goliath is a big giant, and David's just a little shepherd boy, right? Is that basically what it is? Anytime you have, um, you know, just an unfair fight, the enemy that you're facing is just way more powerful than you are. They call it David versus Goliath, and it comes from this story. What you have is you have a massive underdog type scenario. Is there anyone in this room that is not familiar with David and Goliath? Another, never ever heard of I just wanted, I'm just curious. I'm like totally asking you to put yourself out there. I'm just curious. You know, I think of all the Bible stories from the Old Testament, you know, Noah's Ark and maybe David and Goliath and maybe God created the heavens and the earth are probably right up there. So what I want to do, I want to look at that story and I want to see what can we learn from David's victory that really applies in our life. Because if we're honest, sometimes we face battles, we face giants, if you will, that, that we just don't have the strength to match up. We don't have the strength to match up and we either know it or we don't. If we don't know it, we find out the hard way. If we do know it, we're looking to run the other direction. And uh, I can give you just a, a really quick example of what I'm talking about. And uh, when we moved into this space, we started to rent the theater and we had a lease and uh, you know we were so many dollars a month and that kind of thing. And we were trucking along. Well, at the beginning of the new year, we, did, we made a deal with um, the Lynn Development Group that owns this building that we would start to rent the theater out to uh, different customers and whatever, and then we would pay them 10%, and we had this deal, and so we needed to update our lease, and when we updated our lease, everything was trucking along, everything was good, you know, we, we really love this arrangement, things are working well, good friendly relationship. All of a sudden, I get an invoice in the mail for the electric bill. We never paid an electric bill before. And it was dated back to the beginning of the year for, you know, two, three months, whatever it was. And this is at the time when we real life just started being 100% on our own finances, no support from the mothership. We're just like, whatever we get is what we have to work with. And so we were being really careful financially then. We get this bill, and it's a big, big bill. And I'm like, what is this about? And I said, this can't be right. We never paid our rent and utility. We never paid electric separately. What the world? So I get out the copy of the lease, and I'm like, where's the utility page? You know, like, let's, let's, before I, before I call back or do anything, before I, you know, ask, you know, like, freak out, let me just see where it's at, you know, like, maybe I'm in a better position than I really think. And so I'm reading, and I'm like, it says we pay the utilities. We didn't talk about that, though, in the meeting. We, that, we said, it's the same thing, the only difference is we're going to, we're going to rent it out and give 10%, you know, profit sharing. What, what's this utility thing? like, I was totally caught off guard. I'm like, oh my goodness. That's technically a legitimate bill. We technically officially can't afford to stay here anymore. Like, this is a problem for little real life. We're like little David. Financially speaking. Not in terms of who's good and evil. <laughs> and and, and, and our, our, our landlord, financially speaking, is Big Goliath. And they have the upper hand. They, it's illegal. We signed a contract. We said we would pay it. If it goes to the judge, the judge is going to say, you have to pay it. Mm -hmm. And yet, we can't afford to pay it. That would not work out good at all. We take all of our finances to do ministry and just pay a lot. Which shows that they're not really making a lot of money on this space. They're really helping us out a ton. So I said, like, what changed? What's going on? And so we, I, you know, I fired off a, you know, hey, just, you know, email back. And you know, I said, well, look at your lease. It says that, you know. And, and uh, what was going on was they were looking through the lease and realized, oh, my goodness, we haven't been billing them. So we get this surprise bill. Now I'm in a David and Goliath situation. I have uh, no legal standing. 
I have no um, real financial strength, and so I just pay the bill. Well, no, I can't pay the bill. We're on our own, and you guys have been faithful in giving, but we, we didn't have that kind of resources. Now I'm in a situation where I'm facing a tall, big opponent, and I'm little David, and this bill is Big Goliath. And to be clear, the um, landlord's never been, we've never had an adversarial relationship, so I don't care if I have to, not to call them the last. <laughs> Gary's involved with the linear in a pretty good, big way. <laughs> so, I was, you know, that's the test that you're facing. Like, what are we going to do? And that's the kind of thing that uh, um, Israel finds himself in this position. I'll give you the rest of the story in a minute. It really does end quite well. And praise the Lord, right? <laughs> um, so just go to, uh, how about Judges 17, verse 1. Really quick, Judges 17, verse 1. It says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. Let me just tell you, the Philistines are the bad guys. The Philistines are here to destroy and to take over and to, and to do wrong and harm to God's people. The Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Sacco, which belongs to Judah. Everybody say, belongs to Judah. Belongs to Judah. Who does it belong to? Judah. God's people, the promised land, they've gathered, the enemies have gathered their armies, and they're coming against God's people, and they're taking a city that doesn't belong to them. It belongs to Judah. It belongs to God's people. And so we have now a big problem, a conflict. We have a battle that we have to face and we have to fight. And it says, verse 2, And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the line of battle against the Philistines. So now you got army versus army. They lined up. They say, let's get this settled. Verse 3, And the Philistines stood on the mountains, on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and then there was a valley in between them. So where do you think the fight's going to happen? In the valley. Mountain, mountain, army, army, flatland in between. They're just, it's a standoff. It's a stare down, like, Who's going to flinch? Who's going to either turn back or who's going to come charging down the hill first? And so we have a standoff. And this is what happens. And you guys are familiar with this story. It says, verse 4, And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath. I looked up the Hebrew meaning of the word Goliath. It means Philistine giant. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> I thought there'd be something deeper there, but there's not. So uh, his height was six cubits in a span. Uh, in modern terms, that'd be nine foot nine. Some um, manuscripts say four cubits in a span, which would be six foot six or so. In either case, far taller than the average man was about five foot tall. So about as tall as Carrie was the average man. And David would have been shorter than that because he was a youth. So in either case, in physical terms, this is impossible odds to go face Goliath. Goliath was a man of war from his youth. He's a killer. He's been fighting. He could take out any one of them, and they knew it. So there's this challenge being issued. In verse 5, it says his helmet was bronze, and he had an arm with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. So not only is he a big man, he's got huge armor. He's fully covered. There's no way you can attack him. Verse 6, and he had bronze armor on his legs. So even if you try to take out his legs, he's got armor there. And a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of the spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. Which I don't know how much that is, but it sounds heavy. And I think it would, it would kill you. That's the important part. And his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel. Listen to this defiant thing that he says. He says, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? 
And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. I defy you. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all, the, it, all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Everybody say, greatly afraid. Greatly afraid. Here's the thing. This is what's happening, and this is how we can recognize in our life the battles that we face that are, that are giant-like. Anytime any enemy comes against you, comes into what God has promised you, to what God has given you, and says, I'm taking this, we're going to fight man to man, and whoever wins takes all. He says, give me a man, come down here and face me, in the natural. Come and fight with the weapons of war and let's do this. I'm here to take away what is rightfully yours. Now Israel has a champion, don't they? They have. It's revealed in David, but it's really the spirit of, of, of God. And, and Goliath saying, come and do battle with me. What are your natural resources? What do you have? What strength do you have? What is your physical capabilities? What, what kind of bank account do you have? What kind of ability do you have to talk and control and manipulate the situation or, or, or whatever it is? Like, what are your resources? Put them up against mine. And that's kind of how I was looking at it initially with, with the, uh, this big bill that I got in the mail. So... I'm looking at a piece of paper, that's the natural. I'm looking at a bill, that's the natural. I'm looking at a corporation, that's the natural. I'm looking at a, a contract, that's everything in the natural. I'm looking at my bank account, that's my resources. I'm looking for a loophole, there isn't one. <laughs> I'm thinking of, you know, what can we do? We can burn it to the ground. And out of the ashes we will rise again. No, I, I had never said that, I promise. I promise. <laughs> but there weren't options. Come fight with me, man to man. And, and the result was they were dismayed and greatly afraid. It struck fear into the heart of every soldier, including the king. We face these kind of situations, don't we? Mm -hmm. You know, you can't put it on your calendar, today's the day, you know. But when it happens, you know, because there's fear that gets struck into your heart. And you, your mind starts to raise, what am I going to do? How am I going to fix this? What's the solution? Who am I going to call? Ghostbusters. Oh, brother. <laughs> it used to be just Nathan that said those kind of things, now it's you too. Oh, brother. we got two of them now. Well, that's good. That means we're growing, right? <laughs> Please help me get back on track. Better than we're he, man. We're fighting, we're fighting the life. We're fighting the life. That's right. We face these kind of situations, don't we? We face this kind of stuff. And we need to see what is the key. So, verse 16. For 40 days the Philistine came forward and took his stand, morning and evening. Interesting, isn't it? You would think this would all get cleaned up, wrapped up, and taken care of all in a 24-hour cycle. But sometimes it takes time. Forty days they lived in fear, wondering what was going to happen, because Goliath keeps coming twice a day. That's 80 times he came out and was in their face. Eighty times. So verse 23, everything changes when David comes on the scene. Little David, the shepherd boy. He's probably a teenager, so he wasn't just like a total pipsqueak. He might have been 
16 years old or whatever. So he was starting to grow a little bit. His dad sent him down to the battle because his three older brothers were fighting in the army. So he's sending provisions and sending cheese or whatever. He says, give the cheese to the to their captains and, and you know their, their lieutenants and whatever, the officers, and maybe with the cheese they'll have favor. So if you ever get in this situation, don't forget to give cheese to people that are important. That's the lesson. You can go home. And, and it says... But David's on the scene now. He just shows up incidentally because his dad sends him to bring the cheese and bread and what have you. And so verse 14, uh, it says, Goliath came out and did his same thing. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. They're actually running away from him in case he went like, boom, you know, and, and they, they turn and they run. They fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches. And will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So he saw the king as saying, What are my resources? I've got the kingdom. i got taxation power. I can give him a tax break. Um, I have this daughter, you know, so if you marry her, you'll kind of be royalty because you're going to be my son-in-law, and, and I got riches. And so Saul's looking to use his resources. He won't go fight him, but he's saying, I'll pay you to go fight him. And David said to the men who stood by, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Listen to this, though. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Yep. Who is this guy? This is part of the key. We'll bring it up in a second. Remember that. For who, who is he anyways, this Goliath? I'm not impressed. Who is he that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way. And so it shall be done for the man who kills him. So Saul hears about it, right? You guys know the story. The Saul hears about it. There's this, kid, there's this kid here that's talking tough, and he's not afraid, and, and he's different, and he, he, he thinks he can take him on. And so Saul sends for him, brings David, and David says, I'll take care of him. This isn't a problem. Listen, I faced, I faced uh, you know, a bear when I was a shepherd. A bear came to take away a cub, or a cub. What do they take? Lamb. <laughs> a sheep cub. They came and, the bear came and stole one of the sheep cubs. And so that proves I'm not a shepherd, right? And, uh, and, uh, and so I went after the bear. And when a lion came, I went after the lion. And, and, I, and I went up and I struck him, probably with his staff, his shepherd's staff. I struck him. And if it turned, and I, I grabbed that lamb right out of his mouth. And if he turned against me, then I grabbed it by the beard. That's probably the lion, because I don't know if bears have big beards, you know. But I grabbed him by the beard, and I struck him, and I struck him dead. And so here's this kid, he said, I have killed bears and lions with my bare hands, essentially. And whatever shepherds, you know. It doesn't say I hit him with a slingshot, does it? He went right after him, because he's got that shepherd's heart for the sheep. And so, you know the story, you know, Saul wants him to you know, here, put this armor on. He's like, no, I'm just going to face him. I'm going to do it my way. God is going to deliver him into my hand. He says this, verse 37, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me. I got will, all caps, bold, underlined. Size 14 font. <laughs> the paw of the bear. He will deliver me from the hand of the Philistines. Does it sound like David is confident? Does it sound like David is wondering how this is going to turn out or his knees are knocking? He, this Philistine will be like one of them. And so Saul says, well, go and the Lord be with you. <laughs> He's probably getting his chariot ready because I'm about to be inside of here. So verse uh, 
38, so that, that he tries on his armor, that's not going to work. And he just goes down to face him. He gets his five smooth stones, right? And his sling, which is a powerful weapon if you're skillful with it. And he goes down to face Goliath. And it says, verse 41, the Philistine moved towards, moved forward, and came near David with his shield bearer out in front. So he's coming down, the guy's in front of him with a shield. And so he's got like, you know, he's almost like a, a tank, you know, this big man, big spear that he can throw. Guy in front of him with a with a, a, a shield, and here's David with potentially a staff. It doesn't say he has a staff, but he has at least his sling and his smooth stones. Enorm whatsoever. Impossible odds. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he was he disdained him. For it says uh, he was a youth, he was ruddy and handsome in appearance. So just a good looking guy, little youth, young looking, and uh, sound like anybody you know? <laughs> you yeah, looking at him. Verse <laughs> oh, man. Oh, brother. Verse 43. Uh, so, so he doesn't like to look at David. He's like, who is this little ratty kid? Good looking guy, but he's he's not real big. He's not real strong. And this is who you send out. What are you trying to say? You're insulting me. He's getting angry just by the looks of him. I don't even like the looks of him. And verse 43 says, And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? So he probably didn't have his staff. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So Dagon and all these... Philistine God, I curse you and be calling down curses, and now it's a battle of my God against your God. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. That's like when you get you walk in and you, you realize, you know, you get your pink slip and hey, the company's closing and we're moving down south and you're not invited. Or you are invited, but you have to, you know, give up everything, sell your house, get your kids out of school, change everything, and we're not going to pay you as much as we were. But if you want to move, you can. That's what I'm talking about. It's like, oh, crap. Right? Come to me. And I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. The enemy knows how to strike fear into our hearts. Some of the battles we face in life, it's really a question of what voice are we listening to? So then David, I love David. He, he challenges me. I, my knees would have been knocking, but watch this. David says to him, and here's David's comeback. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you down and cut off your head. He's making a prediction here. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines. See, I'm not just going to cut off your head. I'm going to slay your entire army. And I'm going to give the dead bodies of the, of the hosts of the Philistines, all the armies of Philistines, this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into my hand. How many of you want that kind of faith and confidence when you, when you face these kind of trials? When you face situations, when, when the enemy tries to come against you and strike fear in your heart and say, why don't you come down here? You put your resources up against mine. I got something planned for you. Let's see if you can get out of this one. I'm going to give 
your flesh to the birds of the air. How many of you would like to have that, just that assurance in God that says, hey, how about this? I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut off your head. I'm going to kill your entire army. I'm going to give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And all the world will know, all the earth will know there's a God in Jamestown. He's kind of confident, don't you think? This story has always challenged me because I've been not always that confident. I project it, you know. <laughs> it's kind of a game. It's kind of like fun, to, you know, to be cocky a little bit like that. But when it comes down to push and shove and facing a big time giant, whenever I've heard this story, and I grew up in the church, and I always hear this story, I'm just like, that is crazy. Mm -hmm. That it scares me to think about. Like, it scared me to think about. Like, really think it through facing the giant. I could never understand how is it that David just was not afraid. It doesn't say because he trusted in his sling. Because he knew he could shoot him from far off. Listen to this. When the Philistine rose and came and drew near to David... David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. I would have been like, you know, do, 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 you know, like shuffling and like, you know, like, you know, just trying to keep, you know, just in case he's going to throw that jab on her, just being skittish and careful and like looking around for a tree to climb. Like, That's not going to work. There's no trees in this valley. And like, what are we going to do really, you know? Or stay back. You got five smooth stones. You know, start, you know, use all five of them, you know, like, in case the first one doesn't hit him, you've got more chances, right? David runs to meet him. Let's get this party started, right? Just runs right to him, reaches into his pocket as he's running, loads it up, probably sets his feet, and sling. And it says the stone struck him right in the head and sank into his forehead. I'm not a medical doctor. <laughs> but I think the way that worked was his skull would have fractured there and the rock sank in and poked him in his brain in the front of his brain and for whatever reason that killed him and it says he fell down dead David runs up, takes Goliath's own sword didn't predict that part that would have been cool and I'm going to take your own sword and cut your head off with it <laughs> But he just was, he was just fired up. He's giving the word of the Lord. He didn't, he didn't even think, like, where am I going to get a sword? He runs up, gets his sword, cuts off his head, raises up the head, and the Israelite army goes bonsai. The faith, the confidence that David had in the Lord was transferable because he was the Lord's anointed. He was the king of Israel. He didn't have the position yet, but he knew who he was. And shh. I don't know if he shook the head. I don't know how much of the weight. What had a rock in it? Look at that. <laughs> and, 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 and the battle begins, and Israel wins a great battle. Here's my question. What do you suppose was the, the key to victory in this situation? What was the key? Accuracy. Accuracy. Yeah. Pretty much. Let <laughs> this come down to accuracy. That's good. Courage. <laughs> Faith, confidence, trust in the Lord. Right? Pretty much. God was the key, right? <clears throat> Accuracy was important. You really just needed the one stone. I wrote down confidence. When I was looking ahead to this day, I, I wrote down in my notes, you know, like you kind of kind of frame things up and these are the battles we're gonna do, and I just wrote down confidence. David was so confident. But as I started to dig into it, it's like, yes, but I'm not. So, <laughs> how do I know where did, where did David's confidence come from? Definitely uh, some previous battles. I, I would say, well, he, he had faith. He, his confidence was because he had faith, right? So faith is what matters. 
Well, I think faith is just confidence. It's confidence in the faithfulness of God that He's going to deliver. He's going to have my back. How did David know that? Some people would say, because I heard it this morning, well, it came from his, and I've heard it preached, and I preach it, and it's true. It came from his experience. But I'm saying this, experience strengthens confidence. It strengthened his confidence, but it wasn't the source. He had confidence to chase after the bear in the first place. Smaller giant, but it's the, still it's the same situation. What was the beginning of this? Where did it come from? What was the source? It, I think the key is in that when David asked that question, I can't tell you what verse because I didn't write it down. David's question, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Did you catch that? Who is this? He's saying, what's your identity? Identify yourself. He understood, David understood something that nobody else did that day. That the this situation, this is a battle of identity. And David understood who he was in the Lord. Nobody else got it. Who was David? 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. So if you're at 17, flip back one chapter. This is the story of David becoming, being anointed as king. So Samuel gets the word from the Lord. I, I've rejected Saul. I'm picking a new king. I have, uh, I have somebody that I've set up for myself who has a heart to follow me. And you're going to go pick him out of his brothers. And there were seven brothers or eight brothers or whatever it was. And, and David's the last, and they go through the brothers, and God says, I don't look at the outward appearance, I look at the heart, I've not chosen the bigger and the better and the taller. I look at the heart, and I've seen something in this kid's heart that I have desired, and I've sent you to get him. So they go and they fetch David, he was, they didn't even bring him, because they figured, well, they're not going to pick the little guy. The young guy. But God says, that's the guy I'm picking because of his heart. Remember we did Transplant? A heart like David's. We did that whole series. It was awesome. We'll do that again someday. Get back around to it. But God saw something in David's heart that he said, I can work with this kid. Remember last week it was Gideon. And Gideon had this honesty in his heart. And God says, I can work with that. So what happens is, I think David just had this kind of heart to, toward God. Like, I just want to please God. Whatever he asks me to do, whether it's, you know, shepherding these little sheep for my dad, I'm going to be faithful and do it. And, and you know he was out there and he composed songs of worship. He just had this heart of worship towards God. 1 Samuel 16, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, him as David, in the midst of his brothers, watch this, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. The next verse says, and the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. It's kind of crappy for Saul, good deal for David. He is the, you know who David is when he comes on the scene? He's the Lord's anointed. He has the anointing, the Spirit of God on him. The Spirit of Christ was upon him to be the shepherd in Israel. To take care of God's sheep. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, He starts to reveal the Father's heart to you. It says the Spirit of God sheds His love abroad in our heart. It's the Spirit of God by which we cry out, but Father, he, he works in our hearts so that we open our heart and receive the Father. He gives us the faith. He, under, he lets us know the Father's love. And David, here's the key to victory, David had a revelation of God's love for his people. 
David had a revelation of God's love for his people. How do I know? Because you, we have in the Psalms, we have David's um, diary, basically. <laughs> we have his diary, and he wrote it, and it became scripture. And it says in one of the Timothys, all scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's God breathed. God breathed life into David's soul and into his pen. And this is what he writes in Psalm 35, 36, 5 through 10. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, you save. He understood the salvation of the Lord was tied to the steadfast love of the Lord. Verse 7, how precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. And you give them you, you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light do we see. Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Psalm 103, does that sound like he got a little revelation from the Spirit that was on him from that day forward of the Father's love? Did you hear it there? Did you hear how God breathed his life into those words? When, he, when David wrote it for us? Psalm 103, 11 through 13. Verse 11. Let's see if you can measure this. For as high as the heavens are above the earth. When we look into the heavens, what do we see? At nighttime. <laughs> what do we see? The stars, right? As far as you can see with the naked eye, you see the stars. If you use the, the Hubble telescope or whatever kind of telescope, as far as you can see to the edges of the universe, that distance above the earth, whatever that is, that's how great. In other words, immeasurably great. They had no way to measure that. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the, his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west. So if I start walking in this direction, this direction is west, right? Yeah. <laughs> and someone else starts walking in this direction, which is east. As far as Faulkner is from Lakewood. No, as far as the east is from the west. And we just walk endlessly. So we walk around the earth, past each other, say, I'm still heading west, I'm still heading east, okay, let's see, you know, let's see how far, you know, we have our tape measure, just keep wrapping it around the earth endlessly. That's how great his love is. Okay? Sounds like a lot, doesn't it? David's struggling to put into words that make any sense to anyone the greatness of God's love. He had a understanding of God's love. As far as east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As far as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. This is what I think. When David was running to the battle, I think he understood he was right in the very love of God. God's love had worked so much in his heart. He understood it doesn't matter what the situation is. God's right there with me. He's right there with me. He understood the shepherd's heart. What was the shepherd's heart when, when, whenever a, uh, you come back up. as I say, a bad guy, whenever a bear or a lion stole one of his little cubs? <laughs> what was the shepherd's heart? 
Jesus says in Matthew, Luke, or John, or one of John, it's in John, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. What would motivate him to lay down his life for the sheep? It says a hireling, a hired hand, doesn't do that. He says, you're not paying me enough. His motivation is cash, right? Money. What would motivate the shepherd to lay down his life, to go and just fight with and, and put his life on the line for one little lamb? It's not money. They're not worth that much. You let the bear take it. Take it. I still got the 99 over here. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. And Jesus said, greater love has no man than he would lay down his life. And God demonstrates his love for us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Two results of having that. I'm going to let the band come up now. Huh? Oh, the bill. Okay, fine. Whatever. Forget the two results. I'll tell you about the bill. <laughs> How much time you got? The bills are on today. Listen, you want to talk about David and Goliath? Let's talk about the bills real quick. <laughs> 45 minutes. Okay. Fasten your seatbelts. Two results, and then I'm going to tell you about the bill. Thank you, Gary. I walked right in there. I walked right in there and I was like, I'm going to give your flesh to the birds of the air. <laughs> Push the button, security drags me off. <laughs> Never heard from again. Two results, really quick. When you have this revelation of God's love, and I could go all day through the Old Testament, all day through the New Testament, it really boils down to the Spirit of God being on us and communicating God's love to us. The Father's heart. That our sins are forgiven. That He's called us. That He set us free. You know why I would be afraid to go face Goliath? Because I don't really understand, not really, if God is really for me. If I can really trust Him to have my back. David had no doubt about it. It says without faith it is impossible to please God. Because we have to first believe that God exists. Right? You can't put your faith in something that's not real that you don't even believe exists. But we also have to believe that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. In other words, God's nature is love. He will reward you. He will back you up. He is for you. It says in the New Testament, if God is for us, who can be against us? Woo! That's, what, that's what David was tapping into when he said, Who is this Philistine? God is for me. He loves me with an everlasting love. He's poured His Spirit out on me. You know, they call Jesus the Messiah, right? Jesus Christ. Christ is not His last name. It's the Greek word for Messiah. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Christ. Christ means anointed one. That the Spirit of God was anointing Him. Two things it does. One, it drives away fear. Psalm 23, verse 4. You know the 23rd Psalm? The Lord is my shepherd. And David says, I'm the shepherd of Israel. I'm going to take this full up. The Lord is my shepherd. Verse 23, or 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. David ran to the valley of the shadow of death. Not a drop of fear. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod of the Lord. The shepherd's staff, it corrects the sheep, it keeps them on track, keeps them on path. God is our Father. He corrects us. But that staff is very violent against any enemy that we face. 
And David understood that. And he was confident. And it drove fear. And First John says, perfect love casts out fear. God wants to drive the fear out of you. He wants His love to so wash over your soul and your mind, your spirit, that fear has no place. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? The other thing it does is, uh, so, so one is it, it drives away fear. Number two, it compels action. It compels action. David could not come on the scene understanding God's love for his people and do nothing. He knew his identity. He knew he could race to the battle in the love of God and defeat any enemy. But he didn't have the option to blend in because he was the Lord's anointed and, and the king's anointing was on him. And you are the Lord's anointed and the anointing of King Jesus is on you. It's the Holy Spirit. Second uh, Corinthians 5.14 For Christ's love compels us. That's why I say compels action. Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all. That's Jesus. And therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and raised and was raised again. The love of Jesus compels us. We don't have an option. When God works in your heart, you start to understand his fiery love in you. You start to understand that it applies to everyone around us. We don't have the option. To, to walk away from a foe or an enemy that is trying to take what it, the Father has given to us. He's trying to come and take our possession. It's not an option. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach good news. Good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim freedom to the captives. This is the anointing that's on King Jesus, and it's on you. The word Christian means little Christ, little anointed one. We're growing up into him. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart to proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness to the prisoners. Something for everyone. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning. The garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Do you think there's people going around and they believe that their life is in ashes and there's nothing beautiful about them? In this city, have you seen them walking the streets? Have you ran into them in the coffee shops and in the restaurants and in the, in the stores and whatever? The, the, the people that are broken hearted, that are slaves and captive to addiction and to lies, all of it is the work of Satan. Jesus said, I have come to destroy the work of Satan. And God's Spirit was on him to do it. And God's Spirit is on you to do the same thing. The oil of joy instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. There is a spirit of despair and hopelessness that stands over this region like a, like a giant. Saying, Woo! come on, I'll give your flesh to the birds of the field. The field, the birds of the air, whatever. <laughs> the beasts of the field, the birds of the air. I've heard that voice because we've said we're going to stand up. 
We're going to see transformation in this region. And I've heard that boy say, come on. You're not the first one to try. I can kill you. I can drive you out of here. I can ruin you. But when God's love captivates your heart and arrests your life and, and, and He pours out His love in you, you don't have a choice. You're compelled. His love compels us. We're ambassadors. If you keep reading, it says, we're ambassadors of Christ. God is making His appeal through us. Be reconciled. Catching this? So David understood that this is really just a battle of identity. He knew who he was. He knew God was for him and not against him. If he doesn't spare his own son, but freely gives him up, he is for you. So the end of the story was I um, sent the email off. I was trying to be all lawyerly and scholarly and coming at every angle I could. That's not what we talked about. Okay, well, I think we need to have a, a meeting. So we set a meeting. And Jordan and I went in, and I was like, listen, you hit him high, I'll hit him low. <laughs> we'll take him out, and I'll monkey stomp him when he's down. <laughs> <laughs> Flying elbow off the com conference table. And, and no, but what I did say was, this is an example. It doesn't always work this way. But he said this piece about it. It's confidence in the Lord. This is going to be fine. In the natural, I have no way to fight this fight. It's up to the Lord. And here sits Gary. This is his building. So it sounds funny for me to say this. But I said, whose building is it anyways? Right? And you would say, it's the Lord's. But I don't know if everybody knows that, that, that has to make the decisions, and, and uh, who, who, did, who really has the authority to say so here? I was just building myself up in the confidence of who I am in Christ. And we were aligned with His purpose, and it wasn't His will or His purpose for us to pay more based on the conversation that we had. And so we walked in to this conference room and we were outnumbered. <laughs> There's a couple of partners there and, and, and uh, like an accountant type and you know like, uh oh. And they, and, uh, they said, well this shouldn't take long. I'm like, well that could be good or that could be bad. Let's see how this goes, you know. I didn't have any big plan but just to say, you said, this is not the deal we made. We're going to keep the deal we made. And they say, Jason, he's, he's uh, one of the partners, he's, they said, Jason remembers what he said, and we're just going to honor the deal we made, so here's the lease, just need to initial this part, and we're going to add this piece in, I can't remember what it was, but it was what we said, I think it was something about, you know, splitting the maintenance or whatever it was, so we're going to add this in, just because it, it's not really accurate, they remember the conversation, bing, bang, boom, have a nice day, that's all work together like the Smurfs and sing songs and whatever. <laughs> and that was it. There was no battle because we're not enemies in this situation. But, but what could have gripped me with fear and concern, and I could have, if I, if I reacted that way, I could have screwed things up royally and I had to like rewrite the email, be careful of my tone, and don't be, you know what I mean? Like, is that who you are? When you raise your children, you're trying to pass on to learn to the next generation. It's so nice to know that they're, they're here to the Lord. Paved it all over. 
Everybody was happy that way. Father, thank you. Give you glory and honor. We worship you. For I just pray for everyone here today. Lord, we need to have uh, a greater revelation of your love. That is the game changer for all of us. Whatever we've understood, it's immeasurable. It's greater. There's more. Father, reveal to our hearts your mighty love for us. We worship you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's 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 sing it.
this story because I was reading up on it last night. I knew he was preaching on it this morning, so I was like, I was getting ready. Here's the thing. Tim last week said, get ready. Any Sunday now, I could ask you to preach because Carrie is ready to pop. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I got to be ready. I got to be on my toes about this. So I was trying to brush up on the story. I was trying to get ready because she is great with child, if you know what I'm saying. The, uh, so um, what I love was this anointing. And Tim was touching on it a lot, but David was anointed by Samuel. He didn't even know what for. God just said, that's the one. Anoint him. So he anointed him with oil. And in that moment, David had the Holy Spirit rush upon him, right? It came on to him and off of Saul, and there's all the things you can read in the scripture. But David didn't know that the Holy Spirit had left Saul, and that now the anointing was on David. He didn't know that. He just knows that he now is just filled with the Holy Spirit to the brim. But then after that, he goes back to shepherding the flock in the field. For however long, he was just back doing the normal thing. Can you imagine that? I've been anointed by God. There's got to be something that I have to do right now, immediately. There's got to be some big change. You would expect it, but there wasn't. He went back to the field. And he just kept going. And he kept shepherding. And he kept doing what his father asked him to do. Until the day God had appointed. God laid it on his father's heart, Jesse, to send David to, to feed his brothers who were, you know, at the front lines, getting ready to battle the Philistines. God brought David safely there. God showed David Goliath. God laid it in David's heart. That's the man you're going to slay. And God knew at that moment that David slayed Goliath, that that would then set him on a path that was the fast track to being king of Israel. God knew what was going on. He anointed him, and he knew the plan. And from that point on, he's like, this is what's going to happen. Church, as you go out today, know that you're anointed. Walk in that same confidence. And God will put moments in, in your path. Giants like Goliath that need to be slain. But trust me, when I say God's got it, you can do it. All right? You can do it. <laughs> and you can step into what God has predestined as your chore, your job, your task, your destiny, what God has for you. All right? God's got it. You just listen. You just grow in the Word. You grow in the Spirit. You talk to Him. And you accept that you're an anointed child, a son and daughter of, of the living God. Amen? Amen? Go and be blessed through your life, church. Have a great week. Love you guys.